see you as we come together to worship again. My name's Brian, and I'm just so glad that you're here. We prepared a special worship service for you. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful that we could come and worship you today. Lord, clear our mind, clear our hearts, clear all the distractions from our living room, from our kitchen, or wherever we're watching this, and allow us to just sing praises to you, allow us to worship you, and allow us to learn from your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Psalm 95, 1 through 3 says this, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is great, the great king above all gods. Uh, if you are in your living room or wherever, we invite you to stand and actually sing along and worship with us this morning. Jesus, I 
as I sing for all that you've done for me. Well, good morning. Today, I have the privilege of baptizing two ladies, and baptism is one of the things that Jesus clearly teaches us to do. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus says this, says, Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And, I, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's in obedience to Christ's command that we baptize today. There is no magic in the water, and it does not wash away our sins. Only the blood of Christ does that. You see, baptism illustrates Christ's burial and resurrection. Paul says in Colossians 2.12, Having been buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. You see, baptism's significance is in what it symbolizes, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And baptism also illustrates your new life as a Christian. Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so too we may walk in a new way of life. And it's an exciting privilege to be baptizing today in the midst of everything going on and all the uncertainty. It's just a great reminder to see the gospel is still alive, the church is still doing what Jesus asked, and you can be a part of this. So first up, Zoe. Warm enough? Yes, yes. So I have two questions for you. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. And are you committed to following Him all the days of your life? Yes, sir. All right. I now baptize you. I now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Next up, Beth. Warm, right? Oh, it's like a jacuzzi in here. A jacuzzi. Have you committed, have you, have you given your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I have. And are you committed to following him all the days of your life? Yes. Then I now baptize you, my sister. Ready? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, we are so thankful for salvation. God, we are thankful for the opportunity to celebrate the new lives that we, that these have who've been baptized, but we thank you for their obedience in that. We owe everything to you, God. You are our hope. You are our peace in all times. Lord, we sing about that now, that Jesus, you are the one who gives us hope. You are our true and only source of deep, ultimate hope.
It is so good for us to remember that in times like this, we have great unwavering hope in Jesus. He said in John chapter 16 that in this world, you will have trouble. But he follows that up and says, but take heart for I have overcome the world. It's because of this truth that we can have peace, that we can have comfort and hope in all times. I want to invite you now to just uh, take a time of prayer to go before the Lord. Just declare to him your trust in him. Anxiety and fear is a real thing that affects us, but he's so much bigger than all of that. Take some time now just declaring your trust and your faith in him, repenting of times when you are weak in that and just receive the grace, receive the peace that he offers you. where you are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. i 
from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the praise goes to you, Jesus. You alone are worthy. You are holy. You are perfect. God, the only way that we come to you is through the blood of Jesus. We are so thankful for this. We owe it all to you. God, now we pray that you will come and you will speak to us. Through your word, you will teach, you will convict, you will shape. God, we are eager to hear from you. We are waiting to hear from you, God. Come now and speak to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I remember my first sergeant telling us to report to duty at the local university. I had been back from basic training and and schooling for several months. I was in the Virginia Army National Guard, and this particular weekend was very different. You see, we knew we were getting deployed. And this particular weekend, we would find out where we were going and what other unit 
we would be attached to. Once we found our way to the university, because none of us were familiar with it, we walked into this particular classroom. They ushered us in, told everybody to sit down. Our first sergeant did, well, what a first sergeant does. He told us to listen up and show respect, which is something very common a first sergeant will say to a group of rowdy soldiers if a civilian is talking to them. So this lady then identified herself as some sort of counselor. I don't really remember what she did, but she proceeded to tell us and talk about what we would be facing very soon. She painted, well, the picture of war. She informed us that all of us were going and here's what it would look like. She explained the things that we may see and the situations we may face and and how they may be very hard to deal with and how they may mentally scar us. She explained that many of us would see our friends killed. She explained that some of us may have to carry dismembered parts after certain situations. She explained very, very detailed about PTSD and the statistics. I don't remember everything she said, but I remember very clearly she did her job. Because from that moment on, I realized I was headed to war. I would very soon get on a plane, be headed over to the Middle East in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. And what you have to understand is that this was during 2007. Our country had already been at war for five years. When I enlisted in 2006, I knew we were at war. The entire time I was in basic training, they talked about war. We trained for war. They plainly spoke about war. They told us that we'd be going down range with others. We learned to be proficient with our weapons. We learned battlefield tactics. We learned how to clear rooms. We even learned how to throw grenades, which I might say was probably the coolest thing I've ever done. We heard stories from our drill sergeants about war. We heard stories of how their friends went. We saw on the news all they did was talk about the war. When I got back to my home station, we had friends who'd already been, and they'd tell us stories, and people who wanted to go, and others who were interested in leaving very soon. We heard rumors that we may get deployed. The point is, we heard all about it all of the time. But that day, that particular day, when that lady spoke to me about it, I realized that the talk was over and it became real for me that day. That night I saw Jessica. We'd only been dating for a couple of months and she didn't know about the briefing I had that day and and what they told us. But I remember sitting there watching. I don't remember what it was. But I remember looking at her thinking, I may never see her again. I started thinking about all the things I may miss out on, all the things that won't ever happen because I'm going to war. You see, the reality of war was real, and I finally understood that training was over, that I was called to being, I was called up to serve my country, not just during a time of war, but in a literal war zone. I wasn't sure what to expect, but I knew it would be different. You see, I've done a lot of new things in my life like probably you have. And this wasn't the nervousness of newness. This was something bigger. I was being sent to a place where people wanted to inflict bodily harm. And I may have to do the same in order to protect myself and my fellow soldier. You see, that day, war became real. It was no longer a metaphor. It wasn't a hyperbole. It was literal, a real place, a real thing that I was on my way to. And that conversation was over 13 years ago, and I still remember it. You see, that's the conversation the Apostle Paul wants to have with you this morning. He wants to inform you. He wants to inform me. He wants to inform us that we are at war a real, literal war that we must be aware of, prepared for, and engage in every single day. See, because today we're going to finish up our study in Ephesians. We're going to look at the end, Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10. If you have your Bible with you, go ahead and pull them out. This is where Paul tells us to put on the armor of God. So we can take our stand for the gospel and the reality of the world we live in. He turns from the ideal 
to the real. See, if you've been following along with us, what you've noticed is Paul has been painting the picture of the ideal situation. And it can be really hard to grasp with. Remember, he talked about the ideal church and how we should put on display for the world the manifold wisdom of God. And I don't know about you, but you can look around and go, well, I don't really, I'm not sure if that's happening, Paul. We can see the marriage section and say, hey, Paul, that sounds great, but that's never going to happen in my marriage. Have you met my spouse? We can look at the parenting section and go, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Have you met my kids? We can read about the power of God and how it's available to us. And we could think, Paul, yeah, that's ideal, but I'm just trying to figure out how to pay the light bill. Like, I'm not worried about that power. I'm trying to figure out about the power of my house. I don't, I don't even know how to get there, Paul. You see, Paul knows we're asking, hey, you've painted this great picture, but how do we get there? How do we do this? We can think, Paul, I hear you. But the world is rough. Life is tough. And you want me to live this life worthy of my calling? Paul, I get tripped up all the time. How? And Paul's saying, I know. Remember, I'm in prison. I know it's tough. But here's why. There's a real enemy trying to defeat you. There's a real enemy trying to stop you from living the life God has called you to. There's a real enemy who wants to ruin your marriage, who wants to ruin your relationships, who wants to ruin your walk with God. There's a real enemy that's trying to pull you away from God. There's a real enemy trying to strategically stop you from being God, who God has called you to be. Klein Snodgrass says this, I love it. He says, if you seek a religion to make you comfortable, despite all its focus on peace and benefit, Christianity is not it. This is no religion for the weak or the lazy. Passive Christians cannot do the will of God. The very label passive, passive Christian is an oxymoron. A battle is going on, and contrary to our deception, we do not live on a neutral turf. We either live for God or against him. The choices we make either reflect God's character or the character of sin. As Leon Morris points out, you, you can drift into sin, but not into righteousness. You see, perhaps you've heard about the spiritual war and, and you think there's this metaphor, we're just kind of being overly dramatic, but that, no. What Paul's saying is we are at a real, literal war. There's a battle going on. Don't be, don't be taken captive. Don't be passive. Be active, ready to stand for the Lord. Here's what he says in Ephesians 6.10. He says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Did you know you're able to be strong? <laughs> you're able to be strong in the Lord. This power that he's talked about, this, this power available because we're in Christ, he's going to really explain out how we can grab hold of that. So he says, finally, be strong in the Lord, not in your power. I just want to point that out, but it's in God's power. We can be strong in him. How are we able to be strong? Here he goes. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. Look at this, in order to be strengthened, in order to be strong, we have to do something. We have to take an active part in this. You see, in, uh, in, in other places in this letter and in other things he writes, he talks about putting on these new clothes, putting on this new self. This is the same idea that we are strengthened by putting on the armor of God. And this brings us to a very important part. Listen, listen. God's not going to do for you what he tells you to do. Yeah, that was it. God's not going to do for you what he tells you to do. Throughout scripture, we see that God's sovereign, yet we see that humans have responsibility. We know God's all powerful, but yet we know we're held accountable for our choices. And so God tells us to do something, to put on something. He's not going to do for us what he's told us to do. So this is our part. We put on God's armor. This is how we do this. And here's why. He says, put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers in the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. 
And listen, let's be honest. I live in the same world you do. I know talking about the devil and demonic forces can seem outdated and antiquated. It can just seem weird. We know in our modern world, we want different answers. We don't want to, we want to talk about problems without there being a spiritual element to it. And listen, while there's plenty we don't understand, the Bible teaches us very clear that there are evil forces. There are evil beings, and we are told not to be deceived by them. You see, when the, when the scriptures teach us about the devil or demonic forces or the spiritual things out there that are, that are evil, when they teach us about them, it's not so we can know about them. It's not so we can write all this stuff about them. It's so we're aware that they exist and we don't fall into their traps. So we aren't deceived by them. And he's warning us, Paul's saying, there's a real enemy who's strategically attacking us in a systematic, orderly way. Paul's saying, know your enemy. Here's what's behind evil. Here's what it is. And the word here for struggle is hand-to-hand combat. You ever felt like you were in a hand-to-hand combat in life? You ever felt like something was pulling you down? You ever felt like a struggle with sin or evil? You ever just felt like you were fighting temptation, like a real fight? I was like, yeah, we all have. We're in a constant battle with this. There's evil forces that are trying to bring you down and pull you away from God. And here's the important part, they're strategic. They're not accidentally doing this. They're plotting and scheming and brainstorming ways to separate you from God, to pull you farther and farther away. But we're not helpless. We can prepare, verse 13. He says, therefore, because there's a real enemy, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. We then put on the full armor of God. And please notice, this is God's armor, not ours. And that might catch you off guard, this idea of God being a warrior. We hear about his love. We hear about his grace. We hear about him being a father. And, you know, there's these pictures. You may picture God sitting up up there in the clouds with this big old long beard, you know, just this row. But listen to how the Old Testament paints. You know, Paul says it clearly here. But look, Exodus 15, 3 says, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Isaiah 42, 13 says, the Lord will march out like a champion, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal with a shout. He will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. Isaiah eleven five, 5, righteous will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Isaiah 49, 2, he made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me in the polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. Isaiah 59, 17, he put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. You see, because we are in Christ, what is true of Christ is now true of us. And we have access to his armor to take a stand. And this idea of standing isn't being passive. Standing requires an effort. It speaks of strength. It speaks of stability. It speaks of success and conflict. So when the enemy attacks, we don't have to lose ground. We can take a stand for the gospel. We don't have to give up. We can be prepared and ready. He says, stand firm then, verse 14, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with the feet fitted for the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Let's just walk through these real quick. The belt of truth. A belt of truth means to be strengthened by God's truth in the gospel and resolve to live in the truth. It's the truth we have from God and it's the truth we live by. And the idea of buckling it up or tying it up means we're ready for it. We take the gospel of truth and we tie it around us ready to use it. You see, the truth of the gospel or the worldview of the gospel or the story of the gospel is now our truth. You see, the new you has truth and we arm ourselves with it. You see, the primary way the enemy or the devil or Satan, however you want to describe them, the primary way he attacks is through deceit. The Bible calls him the father of lies. Snodgrass says, 
Evil rarely looks like evil until it accomplishes its goal. It gains entrance by appearing attractive, desirable, and perfectly legitimate. You see, we have to un-Hollywood Satan. Deceit doesn't sound like a big deal until you have those thoughts that say you're not good enough. You're a failure. Nobody likes you. Nobody's going to love you. You're alone. You're worthless. You sure you can believe what the scriptures say? You sure Jesus is the only way? You see, you're not the only one who gets bombarded with lies telling you that you're not good enough. You're not the only one that can get beat down by those thoughts that just say you're not good enough, nobody loves you, nobody cares about you, to question everything. And if you allow those thoughts, if you allow that deception, it can beat you down. It can wear you out. So the truth of the gospel is what we lean into. We lean into the truth of what Jesus says about us. We lean into the fact that we are loved, that somebody does care about us, that we are valuable, that we can do things for the Lord. Instead of believing the deceit and the lies, we lean into the truth of the gospel. And then we have the breastplate of righteousness. And this, is, this idea is the idea of being committed and reflecting God's righteousness in our character. You see, God is the righteous one, not us. But he is the righteous one who has justified us in Christ Jesus. We are his saints. Therefore, we are committed to becoming what he has already declared of us. He says we are righteous and holy because of Christ, and so we commit to living that way. And then he says the readiness by the gospel of peace. And I love this because it's more than just sharing the good news, although that's included. What this is saying is that the gospel has illuminated our lives, and the gospel declares urgency for action. The gospel by its very message, the good news of Jesus Christ, should create an urgency in me and in you to be ready for God to be actively seeking ways to be faithful to him. The gospel should stir something up in us to live differently. It's a call to action. The gospel should drive us to make God's love known. And he says, in addition to this, verse 16, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Look at what Wright says. He says, belief in Jesus as the risen Lord and utter loyalty to this Jesus will protect you when the enemy hurls flaming arrows at you. The arrows may take form of doubt or despair, of adverse circumstances or sharp temptation that will burn you up if you let it catch light on you, a personal tragedy or indeed the kind of triumph that tempts you to arrogance and pride. Believing loyalty will quench all of them. And here's the thing about faith. This is so important. Our faith is rooted in his faithfulness. Faith isn't about you. Faith is what you believe about God. When you step out on faith, you are stepping out saying that I can't do this on my own, that God has to come through. When you step out on faith, it has nothing to do with your power and in your ability. And that's where many of us get caught off guard. We want to live in our power. We want to live in what we can do. We want to play it safe. But stepping out on faith is saying, God, it's going to fail if you don't come through. God, we're going to take this leap of faith because we believe you've called us to, because we believe you're faithful and this is what you've told us to do. So we're going to go ahead and do it. Faith is about what he can do, not about what we can do. It's like when I have people over for dinner at our house. If I were to stand on my own power when I invite people over, I would pretty much guarantee that they will not enjoy dinner. All right, they will not enjoy it. I can't cook, but I trust my wife. I have confidence in her. So when I invite people over for dinner, I don't rely on my power and what I can do. I trust that my wife is going to come through. And I don't sit around my house thinking about how terrible of a cook I am. I don't get beat up by what would happen if she wasn't here. I don't get caught up in thinking, oh, this would be bad if it was just me. Why in the world would I get caught up in what I can't do when I'm putting my faith and confidence in her? 
So invite, when I invite people over, I trust that she'll take care of it. And she always does. And I just play my part. When we put our faith in God, we don't focus on what we can't do and how we're not good enough and in our insufficiencies. What's the point of that? We don't put our faith in God so then we can worry about what we don't do. We put our faith in God and just do what he's asked us to do and let him take care of the rest. You see, it's faith that shields us. It's faith that protects us. Not us, but him, because he is faithful and he will come through. And God will lead you and I to a place where our faith overwhelms our fears. Where we learn to trust him. Where we learn that he's for us and he'll protect us. And those lies of the enemy can only go so far. You see, the more serious you are about your faith, the more problems you will face. But that's okay. We just know that the enemy's attacking us. They're trying to pull us down and tear us apart. We've already been warned, so we grab that shield. We protect ourselves with our faith in Christ and his faithfulness, knowing that he will see it through. And we live faith-filled lives for him. So we take up that shield to protect ourselves. And then verse 17, he says, Take the helmet of salvation In the word of the spirit, excuse me, in the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And here's what's interesting about these two pieces. We are to take them. Peace, righteousness, and trust we put on. Faith we pick up. But we must take, as he gives, we must take salvation in the word of God because they are handed to us from God. You see, there's nothing you can do to earn your salvation in Christ You can't put it on. You can only receive it because it's a free gift from God. And you see, salvation's what we put on and it protects our minds and it reminds us that we're loved and we're cared for by Christ. No matter what's happening around us, no matter how hard life may be, no matter how unfair the circumstances are, we know that through our salvation, we are secure and protected. God loves us so much that he wants to spend eternity with us. That while we were sinners, meaning we were separated from God, we were fighting for the other team, while we were at war against God, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And now through our faith in him, we are now his children. And we've been declared holy through Christ. Our identity is tied to that, that we are a new person, a new you, born again and set free. Now, now through Jesus Christ, we have been enlisted into the army of God. That is why it's so important to understand your salvation is so much more than just after you die. Your salvation is what has enabled you and allowed you to be a part of what God is doing in the world. And so we pray take our salvation. We accept that gift from God. And then the one weapon he does give us is the word of God. And the word of God is the gospel. It's the story, the whole thing, the entire scripture. From in the beginning, God created to the very end while he comes back. The gospel is the whole story of what God is doing in the world through Jesus Christ. And you see, it's the gospel that proclaims the victory in Jesus that ultimately evil has been defeated, that sin and death has been defeated, that through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are victorious. And because we can declare that story, because that is the victory we can live in, that we can withstand any attack that the enemy may try to throw at us by putting on the armor and wielding the gospel of Jesus Christ. We declare that victory. Verse 18, he says, and pray in the spirit and on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. He says, with this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for the Lord's people. The one element that then ties all this together is prayer. We saturate ourselves in prayer because we don't fight this battle on our own. We don't do it on our own efforts. We do it with the Lord, with his protection, with his armor. And so we seek him. We ask him. And he writes, says, prayer accomplishes things we couldn't do by our own effort, organization, or skill. 
You see, prayer is vital to our walk with God. It's how we develop intimacy and a relationship with him. Prayer is where we go to him and say, God, I need you. God, I can't do this. (laughs) On my own efforts, it's gonna fail, but God, I need you to come through. And can we be honest, just between you and me, too often our prayers are so weak. We're not asking We're we're just relying on our own power, giving him lip service. When was the last time you were bold? When was the last time you really asked him to come through? When was the last time you really took a giant leap of faith and said, God, if you don't show up, it's going to completely and utterly fail. You see, one of the things Jesus tells us to pray for is deliverance from the evil one. Meaning we're doing things. Meaning the enemy's attacking. So how's your prayer life? Prayer isn't just something that's added in. Prayer is what wraps this all together. And Paul says, be alert, which means watch out or be awake. You see, every soldier knows how important it is to be alert on duty. And Paul's saying, don't ignore what I just told you. Don't ignore what I just said. There's a real war waging. There's battles going on with a real enemy that's trying to deceive you and pull you away from God. And all of us, each and every one of us will face a battle, struggles daily against this enemy. But we have access to the armor of God. Truth, righteousness, the readiness of the gospel, faith, salvation, proclamation of the gospel and prayer. And, you know, we talk about these things like reading the Bible and prayer, and and it just sounds like one of those preacher things to say, but I cannot stress to you how important this is. I cannot stress to you how important it is to put on that armor, not not just before you go to bed. And I know some of you have the way that when you do your daily devotion or you pray and you read God's word, it's at nighttime. But I've never met a soldier who puts on their armor and then goes to bed. We put on our armor to then go to war, to face a battle. So I am suggesting you do this in the morning, that you really take your spiritual discipline serious. You really take reading your Bible and prayer and going through this checklist every single day. And listen, when I was in the military, training seemed like a hassle. We drove, before we drove anywhere, I mean, I had to check my vehicle over and over. Every fluid, the tire pressure, everything, all the time. It just felt like a waste. I had to check my gear all the time. Then my squad leader had to check my gear. Then my platoon sergeant had to check my gear. Everywhere we went, there was so much we had to check and pull out and make sure we had it. We had to clean our weapons constantly. In fact, I had to take apart and put together my M4 so many, I had to take it together, take it apart and put it back together and oil it up and clean it so many times. I got tired of shooting because I didn't feel like cleaning it. No matter how much, no matter how serious we took training serious, it always seemed like a hassle to put on the vest and to wear the body armor, to put on the helmet because it was hot. But when we were at war, the mindset changed quickly. Putting on that armor was now very important. Making sure that gun was oiled up or my weapon was oiled up, ready to go, was very important important. Checking my vehicle was very important. When the reality of war sucked in, all those things that used to be a hassle, now I understood why they were so important. If you understand you are at war and there's a real battle going on every single day, you'll take your spiritual life seriously. You'll take your prayer life serious. You'll take the righteousness and the gospel serious. You see, the truth is many of us prepare for battle anyways. We face our spouse and go, here we go again, another battle. We walk into our workplace and go, another battle, here we go. We see that coworker, we see those people. We look at all these things as battle, but that's not our enemy. And we can easily turn them into enemies, but there's a real enemy and it's not those people, it's not those things. There's something else going on that we need to spiritually prepare for. And you can stand your ground. You can be victorious because the war has already been won. We'll talk more about that next week. So here's what I ask you to do with me this week. I ask you to rap with me. Okay, every day I want you to rap. And that means read something, ask something, and pray something. 
I want you to prepare yourself. Do this for me. Read Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 every day. And this is your checklist. What you're doing is you're going through God's armor. You're going through and saying, hey, am I putting this on? Am I prepared? Do I got this? Am I, do I believe this? So every day read Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Try to commit it to memory because you should probably know your armor. If it protects us in battle, you should probably know what it is. And then I want you to ask yourself a couple of things. Ask yourself before you go out, say, am I prepared for battle today? Am I prepared for battle? I mean, there's a real war. Am I prepared? If, if the enemy is strategic, perhaps I should be as well. And then think through where might the enemy attack? Where might the enemy attack today? So perhaps the enemy may attack your emotions and cause you to live in fear. Though the Bible's pretty clear, there's only one thing we should fear in this life, and that's the Lord. Or maybe the enemy is going to try to recruit you on his team during this pandemic and try to get you to promote fear and panic in others. I have a quick subjective fact for you. Those of you can work through what that means, but I got a quick subjective fact for you. Listen, if we shared the gospel and we shared as much info about Jesus as we do about this virus, we would literally change the world. Many of us know more about the virus than we know about Jesus. And the virus has only been around a couple of weeks, at least in our minds, and Jesus has been around our entire lives. The gospel is what's urgent. The gospel, in light of all of this that's going on around us, perhaps you should know or perhaps it brings to light the important thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we are promised something better, a place better, that the reality of us being in control and that we're, we got this thing figured out is just not true. God's still in control. God still has this and the gospel is more prevalent and more important perhaps in any time we've lived so far. So ask yourself, am I prepared? And where might the enemy attack today? Then I ask you to pray for victory. Maybe it's the sin that you're facing that you're struggling with. Maybe you need to pray for his forgiveness or maybe you need to pray for his peace. Whatever you got going on, I ask you to read Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Ask yourself those questions before you head out in the morning or stay in in the morning. And then talk to the Lord. Because there's a real battle going on. And are you prepared? And the other question I have for you today, those of you who are, are tuned in is, what side are you on? If the gospel is true, if the story of Jesus is true, that means there's a real battle going on and we have to pick a side. See, the scriptures teach us that we are all sinners deserving of God's wrath. Because of sin, we are his enemy. We are on the other team and we all start in the same position. But because of God's grace, because of the cross, Christ died and purchased us through his blood. And he rose three days later and defeated death. The gospel tells us that Jesus came to save us from sin. He came to restore us and has enlisted us into his army. And that we can display his love and goodness into this world. And I ask you, have you given your life to Jesus Christ? If you admit that you're a sinner, if you believe in his finished works on the cross, and if you accept his free gift of salvation and invite him into your life, you too can be a part of what he's doing in this world. You can be enlist in his army. You can enlist and be saved by Christ. And have you done that? Have you turned your life over to him? If you haven't, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer in a moment and there's nothing magical about this prayer. What you're doing is simply talking to him. You're walking through confessing and admitting and believing and inviting Jesus Christ into your life. And if you're ready for that, will you pray this with me? Dear Jesus, thank you for making me and loving me even when I ignored you. I realize I need you and I'm sorry for the sins I've done. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. And I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me of my sins. 
I commit my life to following you. Please come into my life and make me a new person inside. I thank you and I declare Jesus as my Lord, my Savior. Heavenly Father, we all struggle with sin daily. We ask that the gospel and you illuminate our lives, that your spirit helps us see evil for what it is. Father, help us no longer be deceived and see where we're being attacked. Help us fight for our holiness. Deliver us from evil. Heavenly Father, today we commit to stand on the truth of the gospel. We commit to righteousness no matter the cost. We desire urgency for the gospel. And we pray that you empower us to walk by and be shielded by our faith in Christ. Show us where you want us to take more ground. Where you want us to step out on faith. We are your children. We trust in you. In the name of Jesus, our Christ, King, and Lord. Amen. Sing it to the Lord. I just want you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else.
Lord, we come back to this place where we trust fully in you. God, may it be true of each one of us that nothing else will do other than a thriving relationship with you, Jesus. May we not say, all I need is Jesus and something else, whatever that may be. Lord, may it be you and you alone. We thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for working in our hearts. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We hope you have a blessed week, and we will look forward to seeing you next Sunday, Easter Sunday, as we celebrate our risen Lord and Savior. Y'all have a blessed week.